See, if a society is hungry, in that society, food will be the ultimate quantum, to the ultimate value. If you are ill, health will be the ultimate value for you. If you are in poverty, wealth will be the ultimate value for you. If you are deprived of love, love will be the ultimate value for you. If you are deprived of happiness, happiness will be the ultimate value for you. Whatever you are deprived of, at that moment you think this is the highest thing. But even if that happens, people will realize after it happens that it is not so. So right now in the Western world, having been through this industrial revolution, for the first time uh, women <coughs> moving out of the house and that generation which could not… Today women are moving out of the house but they are able to make the necessary arrangements and man has probably adjusted to fill in certain gaps that she left and maybe things are getting little better. But that generation, when suddenly the changes happened, a whole generation of children went without much expression of love towards them. Because it's a… it's a flux that people were still trying to come to terms with how to handle this. Always it was assured the woman of the house will be there and she'll love the children and this is it. But once that changed, before we could adjust to that, one generation or two generations of people suffered from lack of attention and lack of love and this kind of things. Today various things are happening, as there is maternity leave, there's paternity leave, the man will stay back and take care of the child and the attitudes have changed, various things in the world have changed and access to various things have changed, various facilities have come up in the social structure to cater to these things. Otherwise that one or two generations in many ways were very much deprived of love. Because of that, I think there is so much talk about love. I'm not trying to demean love. Love is a very essential ingredient in your life. I would like you to look at it this way. You're looking for pleasantness essentially in your life. Pleasantness means if your body becomes pleasant, we normally call it health. If it becomes very pleasant, it becomes pleasure. If your mind becomes pleasant, we call it peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it uh, joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call it love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If your life energies become pleasant, we call this bliss. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your external situations become pleasant, we call it success. <laughs> so this is all a human being is looking for. So, only if emotionally he is in a sweet place, which is what love is, it's human emotions turning sweet, either towards somebody or just like that, whichever way it happens. Now, just your emotions being sweet, is it enough for you? Don't you need health? Don't you need well-being? Don't you need food? Don't you need peacefulness? Don't you need competence? Don't you need capability? If you have a lot of love and you become incompetent, which happens to lots of people unfortunately <laughs> then uh, I don't think people will enjoy that or relish that. So this talk about love being the core of the universe, all this is simply coming from a certain state of deprivation within oneself. People who have grown up in traditional families in India, we never think of love because we didn't have to think, nobody told us they love us. My mother never ever told me that she loves me, nor did that question arise whether she loves me or not. I did not even realize that I need to be loved. Mm -hmm. Because the whole atmosphere was such that there was… such a question never arose in me, do I need to be loved by somebody? Because mm -hmm. they set such an atmosphere, such thoughts never came to us, it's just like only if there is poverty in the house and there's not enough food, probably you will think so much about food and how to get it. When it's there every day, you don't think about it. You don't think about making an arrangement for it. Mm. Similarly, when love is simply there all around you in every possible way, you never even thought that it is some… it's an… Uh, something that has to be bought from somewhere or gotten from somewhere, you know. So, 
these things are coming from certain levels of deprivation. Love is the sweetest way to be for a human being, it's a good way to be, it's a wonderful way to be. But at the same time, it's not necessary to exaggerate this beyond just some limitation. Now you're talking about, the questioner is talking about love and truth. I don't know what kind of truth you're talking about. If you're talking about the ultimate nature of the truth, it is universality, it is absolute inclusiveness. Love means to love you need to, you're trying to include with love. Moments of inclusion will happen and then you fall apart. No lovers anywhere have found continuous state of inclusiveness. Moments of inclusiveness and then falling apart, moments of inclusiveness, then falling apart, this is how people experience it. So ultimate truth is a absolute state of inclusiveness which you can… which cannot be termed as love. Love is an effort in that direction. So is joy, so is peacefulness. When you're peaceful, you're actually one with everything. When you're joyful, you're actually… when you sit and laugh with each other, aren't you in some way bonded as one? Mm. That's why they're drinking buddies <laughs> going on too well. There are so many gurus, so many methods, so many followers, but so few realized beings. Is the path very tough or our pursuit, pursuit weak? Uh, I would disagree with a okay. question that is, there aren't so many gurus. There are scholars, there are teachers, there are charlatans. <laughs> There are God-men, but there are not too many gurus, there are very few. And are there very few realized beings? Not true. There are many, many realized beings. <coughs> it is just that they don't carry a banner around themselves that they are realized. They are not that gross and they may not fit into your idea of what a realized being is. They may not fit into your ideas of what realized being is, because your ideas have nothing to do with realization. So definitely, the number of gurus are not enough, they have dwindled down. Maybe there any number claiming, anybody who reads one chapter of Gita claims himself to be a guru without any knowledge about himself, okay? Anybody who reads half a book can become a guru, that's a different thing. Anybody who can, especially in the Western world, if you can chant two mantras, you can become a guru. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I know what to do when I've got flops <laughs> <Yes>. now. <laughs> right. You just okay. have to stop cutting your beard <laughs> and learn a couple of <laughs> mantras. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguru. I'll carry your books. <laughs> All right. So, at the same time, there are any number of realized beings. There are any number with us, different levels of realization. It is just that they will not carry a banner on their head that they're realized. They're in fantastic states of experience and perception, but there's no need to carry a banner. And as I said, they may not fit into your ideas, because that is realization. Every time a guru comes, he naturally faces persecution at some point or the other, simply because he doesn't fit into your ideas of what a realized being should be. Because your ideas have been formed by the one who had come yesterday. The yesterday one also, you m you persecuted him because he did not match with the day before yesterday guru. So the today one also, you are having the same problems. So now once this has become accepted, you are looking for other realized beings. You think they will be just like me. People who are around me, in case they realize, you believe they'll be just like me? Not at all. That is not the quality. Realization is not about making carbon copies. Realization is like… like a garden full of flowers. There is a rose flower, there is a lotus, there is a jasmine, there is one tiny tumbe which is the dearest to Shiva, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. tiny little flower. So you think you see a lotus flower and you accept that as realized. See, you have no way to judge. For example, let me put myself into the example. You do not know whether I am realized or not. There is no way for you to know. So you should not even believe that I am realized or not realized. You just have to see whether being with me is useful for your growth or not. If it is, hang around, what does it matter whether I am realized or not? Because you will not know, how will you judge? How will you judge of a dimension that you do not even know 
you have not even tasted. So there is no need to make up your mind whether I am realized or not. Whether I am useful to you or not, that's all.